Well, welcome, people of God. We're here talking today about the second Sunday in Easter. So this is, thir sorry, third Sunday in Easter. I got the number. Um, this is for April 18th, and we are delighted that you are joining us here for our All Saints Preaching Podcast. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. And so we shall. All right. The introduction for this coming Sunday, April 18th, reads the gospel for this third, third Sunday of Easter is always one in which the risen Christ shares food with the disciples. Meals that are the Easter template for the meal we share each Sunday. In today's gospel, Jesus, the incarnate one, both shares the disciples' food and shows them the meaning of his suffering, death, and resurrection through the scriptures, the two main elements of our Sunday worship. Hallelujah, Jesus is risen. He is risen, is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Vicar John. You're going to be taking us through the first reading of Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. Um, Sundays and Seasons opens up our reading with, After healing a man unable to walk, Peter preaches to the people describing how God's promises to Israel have been fulfilled in Jesus through the proclamation of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, God is offering them forgiveness and restoration in Jesus' name. Our first reading is from uh, Acts 3, 12 through 19, but I'm going to start um, at the beginning of the chapter because I think in order to really understand uh, what's going on here in our text for this morning, I think we really do need to start um, with the first 12 or first 11 verses right before our text, um, just to make sure that um, we know kind of what's going on. So I'm going to start uh, reading the text from Acts 3, verses 1 through 19. So here we go. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he would ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to re receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and he immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood up and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And now, while he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to him uh, in the portico called Solomon's Portico, uh, utterly astonished. And here's our text for this morning. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety, we made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, our, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murder given to him, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. 
in this God fulfilled what he would foretell through the prophets that this Messiah would suffer. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So a little bit of background. This is uh, Peter's second um, sermon in Acts. And it's just a chapter away from the one he delivered the day of Pentecost. And it's interesting to note that after both of these sermons, mighty acts precede what happens. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit of God fills the room where the disciples are sitting and sending them on spiritual fire. In Acts 3, Peter and John demonstrate the power of Jesus' name by healing a crippled beggar. And after both of these sermons, um, the first one, 3,000 people were baptized. And after this one, 5,000 people uh, believed after this second sermon. But given, um, I, I, in my reading, I came across, uh, I, actually, I, I saw this a while ago, but I think it's really pertinent to, to read this um, piece that I came across. Um, and it's called More Than the Eye Can See. And it's by Stephanie I hope I get this name right, Buck Hennon Crowder. Um, and I want to read this, uh, this piece. It's, I've, I've, um, I've reduced it and I've modified it just a bit, but these are mainly her words. Um, and given the fact of what happened yesterday and kind of what's happening here in the Twin Cities over the course of these last number of months, I think it's really important to hear these words. We do not see things as they are. We see things as we are. This Talmudic quote is, did I pronounce that right, um, Rebecca? Talmudic, but I mean, up to you. No. Notes that seeing is not always vision. What we see in life is more than what the eye beholds. A person or circumstances right in front of us can be merely the surface of someone or something more profound. The United States must forever recall the struggles, moves, and marching of the women and men across the Edmund Pettus uh, Bridge, which was the site of the bloody conflict of Bloody Sunday on March 7, 1965, when police attacked civil rights movement demonstrators with horses, billy clubs, and tear gas as they were attempting to march to the state capital, Montgomery. Over 50 years ago, ordinary people walked for the right to stand up and be counted. To the naked eye, these sojourners lacked political clout as much as they did fiscal wherewithal. These citizens were not persons of means, but their intentions were good. They meant well. They meant to do whatever to get the right to vote. No whips, dogs, horses, hoses could stifle their efforts. The Americans who march from Selma to Montgomery may not have looked like much, but their actions changed this country's political horizon and racial landscape. Yes, a yearning in their loins propelled them to create social change. They were going to vote at any cost, at any price. In this week's lectionary passage, a man crippled from birth wanted change. Actually, he wanted coins or any alms that Peter and John would offer. To this man, the two disciples were in better shape than he was. From his perspective, he could surely benefit from whatever they had to offer. Yet Peter exposes their state. Look on us. We don't have a nickel to our names. There was nothing spectacular or dazzling about Peter or John. They were common first century fishermen turned disciples. Their lot was that of trying to communicate the kingdom message of a crucified and resurrected, resurrected Messiah. No bling, no gold, nothing platinum about them. Nonetheless, what they gave to the man, lame from womb, was beyond value or measure. The duo could not give dollars or cents, yet through an act of mercy, they provided more than money could buy. Peter pulls the man up by his right hand, hands, stands him up, 
and the man's limbs enable him to walk, even jump. This man who sought fiscal handout was now the recipient of a physical healing. The desire for one type of change led to a different degree of trans transformation. In their human packaging, Peter and John demonstrated there was more to them than the eye could see. There was a simplicity of presence that cannot shroud depth of ability. The man at the gate, beautiful, witnessed it. Those marching over the waters of the Alabama River in 1965 affirmed it. With the help of two undistinguished disciples, the man in Acts was able to stand and walk. The actions of working class citizens converging in Selma forced a nation to stand still and watch while images of police brutality catapulted across television screens. These scenarios remind America that we must continue to protest until all forms of racism are stomped out. Because while it might appear that we are in a post-racial world sometimes, or that things are so much better than 50 years ago, there is more to this than the human eye can see. There is more to us than the human eye can see. Finally, I want to end with this thought for you. Peter, in this text, in Acts, repeatedly uses the, uses the word rejected here in his speech. And it's the same Greek word used for his own denial of Jesus. In verse 14, but you have rejected the Holy One and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer taken to you. And in Luke 22, then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him and said, this man was also with him, but he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. Is rejection, this is my question, is rejection, is rejection always something that we do? Or is rejection sometimes something that we neglect to do or don't do? Those are my words for this text. Thanks. Wow. I'm really glad that you added verses 1 through 11 mm -hmm. um, because this is such a frustrating text on its own verses 12 through 19 I mean it's like it's Rebecca brought it up last week uh, in the when we talked about the glorious gospel of John how problematic that text has been for the history of Jewish Christian relations and this is another one of those texts that has just fed into that I mean, like when I, when you just read 12 through 19, it's just gross. I mean, without any of the rest of the context of chapter three, it's just, it's gross and it's blatantly anti-Jewish and it has fed into that history of if you're not Christian, you're out. And, and that is, is so problematic when, when that's all that you hear on a Sunday morning, right? Like for this text to be read on a Sunday morning and to stand alone without any context, I think that's the, that's why this Bible study is so important. And that's why um, I think bringing in those first 11 verses is so important because it, it wraps us into a context that, that is not any necessarily less problematic, but at least it, it broadens the ability to, to look at the text. And it reminds us that when, when Peter's talking to people, he's talking to Jews. He's, he is, this is part of the lengthy historical family argument that happened amongst the Jewish people at this time. I mean, and so we, we've lost that in our modern day context. As Christians reading this text, we don't recognize that this is Jewish people talking to Jewish people. Um, we think that this is Christians condemning Jews. And that is not what's happening here. Um, and so to wrap that all in the context, I think is so important. Thank you, Tanner. Yes, please. Thank you, John. When I listened, I was back to watching this on television in my safe little home with a new television, black and white, and watching on the 7th of March and seeing what none of us could believe in our safe little California mountaintop home. And things haven't changed much. Thanks, John. Yes, there is a 
It's a bleak time for our nation and our world. All right, let's move on to Pastor Rebecca, who is going to take a run at Psalm 4. Four. And thank you for your question, Psalm 4. Who's heard of Psalm 4? Um, but granted the bleakness of this time, a couple of the commentators talked about this as being a prayer. And I will divide it up into a couple of pieces that make it easier for me. Um, and some parts don't apply to everybody. But within this psalm, listen for those parts that apply now to your life this day. And Jules, Tanner, and John, I will ask you what parts of this psalm stood out, because I see it as a collection of little prayers. Reading in the name of the Lord, Psalm 4. To the leader with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for God's self. The Lord hears when I personally call. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. Psalm 4. I don't remember ever hearing this psalm before, but if it's in the lectionary, surely we've all heard it and likely even studied it. But granted the introduction John gave us to Acts and Tanner and Jules talking about the pain people are suffering right now. What in this psalm, what phrase or phrases stood out to you? I read it afresh as if I'd never heard it before because I don't remember it. But after you answer, I'll tell you what stood out for me. The line that stuck out for me was, how long will you love illusions and seek after lies? The <laughs> second part of verse two, I feel like there's been, I, I don't think that that's necessarily a just a now thing, but it's that historical struggle that we see presented throughout the whole of scripture and then lived out still today. And mm -hmm. I think that it is both a personal and communal struggle that we continue to deal with. Oh, I agree. And that's the value of other translations. I'll slip in a couple of others, but absolutely. Will you love delusions? and seek lies. I would say for me, it would be ponder it on your beds and be silent. The second part of verse four. I, I think that there is, uh, well, the definition of ministry, show up and shut up. Sometimes we don't need to use words. We just need to stand beside someone or walk beside someone or sit beside someone. That's the one that stood out for me. And if I can slightly change the words I have in the NRSV, when you're angry, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Absolutely. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. where I landed as well. And it may be the first part, when you are disturbed or angry, um, it's too easy to let the, the tongue start flapping right away. Um, I love this wisdom of, yeah, keep the tongue from flapping and ponder. I love that. Yeah. Stop it. Put yourself in a holy timeout. 
<laughs> Not being as deep as you folks, um, one particular phrase just, well, I've already said it today in council, um, let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord, and you alone, O Lord, make me lie down and say, let the light of your face shine on us. Let the face of the Lord shine on you. The ironic blessing that many end all services with. And of course it stood out because I love Hebrew and the echo of Hebrew throughout the old scripture, whenever one phrase echoes another phrase, the two come together and are more uplifted as they come together. And it's easier to see it in the Hebrew than it is in the English. And it's why so many different translations of the English are so valuable. But may the face of the Lord shine upon us. Let the light of the Lord shine upon you. I mean, they're just gorgeous together. And as Jules and John have said, I would go down to the last one. Um, verse 8 echoes verse 4. And that's so classic in Hebrew. For you alone, you alone. Oh, Lord, make me lie down in safety. Who of us have not felt a time when we needed to call on the Lord simply to lie down? Because there was so much noise and fear in our world. Four echoes eight. Um, I love the Hebrew and the repetition. And in this case, it's easier for me to understand this psalm as I look at its structure, and verse 1 echoes verse 8, which is a very common structure in Hebrew. 2 and 3 echo 6 and 7 with a slight turn, and 3 and 4, that uh, 4 and 5 that um, Jules and John picked out is kind of the heart of the matter as you look at that. Um, don't sin. Offer right worship. Put your trust in the Lord. And one and eight call you back to that piece. One makes the call, eight answers. So going through these step by step, one calls for help, eight gives you the conclusion. And um, one is kind of fun because it can also be read when I was in a tight place. You gave me space. You made a wide place, oh Lord. Um, which is easy to hang on to. Two and three, complaint and confidence calling out those who've afflicted the psalmist, those who have spread the vain lies and the problems, Tanner. Mm -hmm. And then three, um, even more Tanner, the confidence of the faithful is the adjective of your word, chesed, loving kindness. Here is the faithful in a slightly different form. Four and five, don't get angry, be silent, ponder, Put your trust in the Lord. Six and seven, the confidence triumphs over the complaint. Not over only over the complaint, but even over earthly riches, which for them would be the wine and the grain, because this was an agricultural society. <clears throat> but the trust in the Lord, you put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine abound. And then the conclusion in eight allows one to lie down in confidence for you alone. You alone, O oh Lord, make me lie down in safety. Each verse in itself is a complete prayer, a little more comprehensible, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one answering eight. But all together, each one of these contains a prayer that we can ourselves pray in this day. Thank you for coming along with me on Psalm 4. Nice. Thank you. Love it. All right, PT. What's up? Are you rolling on Luke 24? You want me to read it? Sure. Is that what you're asking? Um, all right, from Sundays and Seasons. In this account of an appearance after his resurrection, Jesus opens the minds of the disciples to understand him as Messiah. Jesus convinces them that he has been raised and sends them on a mission to proclaim the message of repentance and forgiveness. Luke chapter 24, starting in 36b. 
Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is very much an echo of what we heard last Sunday with the Vicar John's Peace Be With You and the you know, Jesus appearing to the disciples behind locked doors, second appearance. Um, I read an article by Nadia Boltz-Weber that I thought was, was great. She preached a sermon on, like, what you said, John, like, doubting, why does, why does Thomas get such a bad rap? And, and her comment was, maybe we should just call him Tactile Thomas. <laughs> just wanted, wanted to actually feel... <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to touch the living Christ. Uh, so the Luke inversion here starts out with, uh, in the earlier part of 24, the resurrection story. And um, Mary Magdalene shows up again, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and other women. Um, and Peter runs back, checks out the tomb, sees the linen folded. And then you get that wonderful story of on the road to Emmaus, which is like one of my one of my favorite stories. Uh, these two guys that are totally bummed out walking along the road. That's actually the 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 note in my margin of my Bible says they stood still looking sad, and in the margin it says bummed out. So I don't know if if our um, our Greek scholars in this room would see if that's the actual translation of the word <laughs> looking sad bummed out um but what i what i think i like about not only the acts uh text read in context again and this text is that you hear the story over and over and over again you hear about the death the resurrection the reality of that the peace be with you um, so he eats a piece of fish. Why is that important? Because the incarnate one, God made flesh living among us, is real. It's, this isn't a ghost. Yay! Down with the docetics! Burn the heretics! Say more. People don't understand what you're talking about. Not everybody has a theological Bible. Or the one dictionary. of the one of the early heresies is like this is where it gets disputed and knocked out in Nicaea that that Jesus was alive and that that was important that he was a body physical right both while he was like and that the resurrection actually happened. That's the whole point of the fish, right? Mm -hmm. Like if he was a ghost, it would have fallen right through him, but it didn't fall right through him, so he must have been a body just so cool and very important and it keeps coming up again and again and again super important um so i'm going to read just a little part of a quote by barbara brown taylor who is an episcopalian priest and superstar preacher she wrote a book called an altar in the world many of you have read this book if you haven't read this book we have copies of it laying around the church and we can get one to you if you're interested but i love this book it i think i love this book so much because she talks about potatoes in one chapter and it's just it's so sweet 
Uh, she's not talking about potatoes here, though. That's a different story. She says, the daily practice of incarnation, being in the body with full confidence that God speaks the language of the flesh, is to discover a pedagogy that is as old as the Gospels. Why else did Jesus spend his last night on earth teaching his disciples to wash feet and share the supper? With all the conceptual truths in the universe at his disposal, he did not give in he did not give them something to think about together when he was gone. Instead, he gave them concrete things to do. Specific ways of being together in their bodies that would go on teaching them when they needed to know when he was no longer around to teach them himself. Um, I'm just going to stop there because I think that we all need concrete things to do. And I don't know what that looks like, but I think we as, as a collective need to consider what are the things that we can do um, that are concrete. And as a, as a pastor, I love doing projects. It gives me a sense of having a concrete thing that I've done, like I can see evidence because in ministry, you don't know uh, whether or not, like the words of comfort that you gave were helpful or not. Like, we're not going to know if we were effective in ministry until we're dead sometimes. <laughs> so the more concrete things we can do, I think, uh, show up, do good, be kind, repeat. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Do you have uh, any more words of wisdom? I have, I have two things. Great. Can I share a quote from you for you as well? This is from uh, Dr. Richard Swanson, who's a, who's a New Testament professor at Augsburg, one of the Augsburgs, I think. Um, he talks about this text as anchoring the resurrection in the real world, which I think is a really cool way of talking about it. And it kind of echoes what you were talking about as well. Um, but he focuses on this idea of Jesus eating, meaning that Christian faith is not a disembodied religious feeling or a faith that only ripens in heaven, which I think is a super important point that this text makes. The resurrected Messiah doesn't transform his followers into spirits who are free from earthly concerns because they are above it all. Instead, he joins them in one of the most earthly of everyday activities in eating. The resurrected Messiah engages in real, physical, earthly, physical, social, political, economic, complicated world and resurrection works out its meaning on earth. Going to heaven is so much simpler than experiencing resurrection life here on earth. I love that. I think that that's really cool. And it reminded me of this. Uh, so at some point in time in the last 10 years, I shared a video of MLK's uh, I've Been to the Mountaintop speech. Somebody probably shared it. It, it, it. It's April 3rd, right, is the anniversary of when he shared that speech. And so because of Facebook memories being what they are, it, like, comes up every year. And so every year I just, like, I play the video because it's short and it's a good speech. And I, when I was reading this text today, I, I thought about that speech um, because his whole focus in that text or in that, in his speech, I've been to the mountaintop is about that idea of mountaintop experiences, right? And this idea that he has seen the promised land. But Martin Luther King Jr. doesn't talk about the promised land as this like ethereal vision behind the veil of what is to come in this heavenly gate sort of glimpse, right? He's not talking about like, I have, I have seen the promised land in the sense that I have seen um, heaven and the resurrection and the promise of eternal life he's talking very specifically about like i have seen hope in this world i see a future in which this injustice doesn't exist anymore and that's what he talks about is the promised land which i think is is exactly what we get in this resurrection language from the messiah again and again and again these weeks of easter is this idea of like living out resurrection life here and now and what that means. What does it mean to find places of hope and to, and to find the promised land in the here and the now 
and work for that, which is, I mean, Jules, you were talking about that as well. And that I think becomes the important call that we hear again and again from resurrected Jesus to the disciples, to us all the way through Pentecost is this, this constant language of, of take your bodies and do something with them. Like I am here with my body, you to teach you what to do with your body. And there are a lot of places where our bodies could be used in the world right now. Conveniently, many of them are not too far away at all. So uh, that's, that's, that was the other thought that kind of popped into my mind. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a divide in Christianity and the, that sort of, um, you know, I'm, I'm working my way to heaven, you know, that until I get there, I'm doing this stuff I'm doing, um, I'm righteous, you know, all the focus is on getting to heaven instead of like creating a heaven here for people that might not have that, you know, so the other piece that I, I really appreciate, this is a, my friend Jen said this to me, and I, I just put it on a post-it note and I've been thinking about it, that holding hope is a prayer. Like holding hope is a prayer. And I think that's, uh, we hold hope for the future. We're not there yet, but there are plenty of things that we can be doing. And you know, we take this the Psalm four. We glance at the the Acts test. We we look at this uh, beautiful text in in Luke and being reminded that peace is with us. God breathes the Holy Spirit upon us. We are actually the incarnate ones. All of us collectively are. So what does that look like? You know, we have Jesus as the model. So giddy up, Buttercup. I feel like that's enough food for the journey for this week. Well done. Well done, Christian public leaders. How about some announcements coming up here? We have uh, in-person worship. We do. We have in-person worship every Sunday uh, at 9 and 1030. And you can find information about how to sign up for that on the homepage of our website, allsaintscg.org. Uh, click on the button that says click here to sign up for in-person worship. Uh, that'll take you to a sign-up genius, and you can sign up for, right now, the 18th and the 25th are open to be signed up for. So um, if you have any issues with that, shoot me an email, tanner at allsaintcg.org, or give us a call at the office, and we will get you signed up. Okay? And it's never too late. I mean, people literally registered to sign up for worship on Sunday morning while they were sitting in the parking lot because they had forgotten to register to sign up. So, I mean, it'd be nice if you did it earlier than that, but you can so you got plenty of time to do it um also a reminder that we're going to continue to do um wednesday night communion drive through communion here at all saints uh and for our community over at north square at four o'clock so we'll love to have you there for those things and what else is coming up there are probably many things we're still doing um communion at north square at four o'clock mm -hmm. For residents of Norris Square. And uh, I think Pastor Rebecca has been doing a psalm each week, which has been very fun and interesting. Probably do Psalm 4 this week, maybe, huh? You think? <laughs> that sounds like an awfully good idea. Right? Sure. All right. Oh. I think that's it, though. Make sure that you read our it. newsletter and check out the bulletin. It's got all kinds of pertinent announcements in it. Yes, and you can grab that online. That's not going to be a physical paper copy that you're going to take home from worship. Nope, all online. It's online. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Blessings.